In this film, we're exploring the theme of journeys and the relationship between writing, language and place. I'm Fiona Dolican from The Open University and I'm at the start of a journey of my own. I'm on my way to Shetland in the far north of Scotland. It's a place I've never been to except in my imagination. Through the work of the person I'm going to meet, travel writer and novelist Malachi Talak. On this trip, I'll be thinking about journeys real and imagined, of what goes into the making of a travel memoir and the kind of links there may be between a novel set in a fictional valley and the actual landscapes of Shetland. My process in writing tends to be that I don't know exactly where I'm heading to when I set out on a project, and that's been true both with non-fiction and with fiction. In the non-fiction, I've tended to let the research drive where I'm going to and then the questions that emerge from that research. 60 Degrees North is a travel book. I start out in Shetland and, and travel around the world to each of the countries that lie at the same latitude. And I wrote about those places, about their history, their culture, their landscape. But along the way, I was also asking questions of myself and about my own relationship with this place. So those memoir elements started to weave through the book. It's a book about travel, but it's also a book about home. So we're getting towards the place now where 60 degrees north uh, the book began. And it took you a while to get there, I seem to remember. Yes. I spent a long time trying to find the right spot on the map where the parallel met the sea. I was hot and thirsty and annoyed at myself for not bringing a GPS to make things clearer. For a moment, it all seemed arbitrary and pointless. There could be no real certainty like this. But still, I wanted a fixed point, a starting block from which to begin. So I looked again at the paper, read again every word of the surrounding area. To the south, the bergy stacks, the cave, and the seat of Mandrop and Sheep Pond to the north. Just east was the green of Mandrop, the field behind me. I wanted to find a, a starting point where, where the line met the sea, and this, this was it. This well, it's is certainly quite a dramatic start. <laughs> This is the Atlantic Ocean. And then I saw it, almost completely hidden by those words, green of mandrop, but just protruding from behind the letters on either side was a solid straight line, a fence. And as it reached the cliff, it corresponded with the parallel. I stood and faced east, following the posts that ran through the field and up the hill, and then looked back to where the fence ended in a muddle of wire and wood hanging over the cliff edge. So this was it, 60 degrees north of the equator. This was my starting line. I met with Mark Ryan Smith at the Shetland Museum and Archives to find out to what extent Malachy's work fits within the body of Shetland literature. There are many travel books about Shetland, but often they're travel books by people who came to Shetland. They would see an exotic place that was different as, as what they were used to. They would see the wildlife, the archaeology and so on, and write a travel book and go away again. But Malachy's travel book is different because it's written about travelling around the world, but Shetland is always the point of return, and he seems to be trying to find a way to belong or have a relationship with Shetland by doing this journey. My family moved to Shetland when I was quite young, nine or ten years old. We moved from the south of England and it was a big change at that age and it was quite a difficult change for me. And I think that because of that I've always had these 
questions in my mind about what does it mean to feel at home in a particular place? What does it mean to feel connected to a particular landscape? And it was those questions that began in my childhood that later came on to inform 60 Degrees North in particular. The landscape that truly shaped me was that of Shetland. This is where I became the person I became. This is where the conflicts that would form me were fought out. That I came to love this place, having once hated it, is strange and yet entirely coherent. It was a process of understanding, familiarity, and, I suppose, of forgiveness that brought me back here. In the end, I accepted the centre around which my world was spinning, and I turned towards it. In some ways, beautiful though it is, Shetland would traditionally have been quite a difficult place to live in terms of its landscape and in terms of its climate. And I think that part of what interests me in writing about it is that difficulty. Why is it that people choose to live here? Why do people love this landscape? And why do I love this landscape? I suppose those are the kinds of questions that make this a fascinating place to write about. Maliki's work isn't interested in the sort of iconography of Shetland. He's not interested in Vikings, he's not interested in ponies and all the stuff that we see in sort of tourist promotion of Shetland. He's interested in the sort of quiet, unseen transactions that happen within the landscape and within communities. Malachy took me to a place that provided inspiration for the setting of his first novel, The Valley at the Centre of the World. So traditionally, I suppose many or most people in Shetland would have lived in small communities, kind of clustered close to the sea yes. like this. So I'm fascinated by these places where that sense of community is still ongoing. The valley at the centre of the world is the story of a small farming community in Shetland. The novel is set within this valley and follows the lives of all of the people who live there over the course of about 10 months. So the valley that we're in now is one that's very familiar to you because you spent a couple of years living here, but you've set your novel in a fictional valley, which has some similarities to the one here. The novel is, is based on, I suppose, an amalgamation of, of various places that I have lived and, and known in Shetland. But I was very certain that I wanted the place in my novel to not be a real valley. I didn't I didn't want to take a, a place and write about it. And the reasons for that, I suppose, in part, are having the freedom in a novel to create the landscape that is, is right for the, for the drama, for the story that you want to tell. So this valley, in some ways, is, is quite similar to the, the valley I was writing about in the novel. It has that kind of tight, fold with the houses up on the, on the side of the valley. And th what that means is that for people who live here, they're seeing this place as the kind of background to their lives, but also they're looking out on each other. What that can do is bring about a sense of, of community, of kind of entanglement between people, but it can also bring about a sense of tension sometimes, I think, that is the perfect ground for storytelling. This morning, Sandy had to help Emma's father with the killing. The lambs were ready and the day was dry. Last week, he'd promised he would be there to lend a hand, to do what needed done, but he hadn't known then that Emma would be gone. 
He poured a bowl of cereal and boiled the kettle. He ate at the table, then stood by the window to drink his coffee. From there, he could see the valley laid out in front of him, the brown thread of the burn unspooling through the crook of the land. Starlings squabbled on the stone dyke in the corner of the garden. Sheep grazed and gossiped in the nearest field. Outside Maggie's house, at the end of the road, a cockerel announced itself to the world. Beyond, the valley slipped into the sea. A glaze of salt on the glass made everything look further away than it ought to be. When I was thinking about relationship to place, that can never be a single truth. And what fiction allows you to do is to have multiple truths together through these different characters. And once I had my cast, I knew how they spoke. In Shetland, lots of people don't speak standard English. They speak variations of the local dialect. And so it was, it was really crucial for me to get that dialect in there. But I didn't want that to then become a barrier for people who were not used to seeing these words and these spellings on the page. And so putting the, the glossary in, I hope, allowed people to get more of a sense, not just of the meaning, but of the, the sound of this language and these words. Local Shetlander Mary Blance brought the dialect and dialogue to life for me through her readings. Caddy, a hand reared lamb. Clarity, dirty. The day, today. The morn, tomorrow. The night, tonight. Dana days, in those days. Doot, used to express a lack of doubt. I doot it'll rain means I think it will rain. One of the things that I found striking in Malachy's novel was the inclusion of a glossary. Well, a glossary is not unusual in Shetland writing at all. What I find so interesting is that the glossary is right at the beginning. In terms of comparing it with other novels, well, you'll maybe get a list of the, the characters in the story and who they are. This seems to almost introduce Shetland by giving you a kind of an insight into how the people speak, into the language, the dialect, that so much part of the world you're going to enter when you actually start reading the stories. David and Sandy sat across the table from one another, but both were looking out of the window over the valley at the whitened hill and the sea. Their hands clasped around the hot mugs in front of them. Looks good fit in here, Sandy said. Aye, looks pretty good fit out there too, David replied. Just a pity but calder. He said nothing for a moment and then turned to Sandy. I hae some news for thee, he said. Then paused a second longer, trying to find the right words. It seems Maggie may just have decided thy future. Malachy could have written this book about Shetland and not used the dialect at all, just left it, left it out, written all the dialogue in English. But that could have been about anywhere, an island anywhere, a tiny community anywhere. And the dialect defines the, the sense of place. It gives you Shetland when it's there on the on the written page. When writing about place, I wondered how important Malachy thought it to write yes. what you know. Yeah, write what you know is in some senses good advice, but it can feel quite limiting to people. Although, of course, I have written a lot about Chetton, which is the place I know best. But I think better advice that somebody gave me was write what you want to know. Write what you're fascinated by, what interests you, what you want to discover. Because when you write a book in particular, you're going to be spending a long time with these words and these ideas. On this trip, I've learned that for Malachy, writing is a journey of discovery. He sets out in his work to seek answers to a set of questions. In Shetland, I've also understood how using dialect 
can situate characters and experienced the rootedness of language in place. 